All right, it looks like we are ready to begin. Am I correct? All right. I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to a wonderful webinar we have put together on the show called Alma's Way, produced by Fred Rogers Productions. And first of all, I would like to introduce Ellen Doherty, the executive producer and chief creative officer of Fred Rogers to tell you a bit about the show and launch our discussion. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation tonight. Um, Alma's Way launched on PBS last month, just literally over a month ago. Um, and we are really so proud and so pleased with the show and the reception that it's been getting since it's been um, out in the world. I'm sure many of you know that feeling of working on a show for years, <laughs> and then finally you get to share it with everybody and people see it and it gets to be, have its own life. So that's the phase that we just uh, just got into about a month ago. Um, we really appreciate, uh, so it's a show about um, Alma, who's a six-year-old Puerto Rican girl from the Bronx. It's all about critical thinking and problem solving. Um, Alma lives uh, with her mommy, papi, junior, her little brother, um, her abuelo, um, next door, her Tia Gloria, Uncle Nestor, and cousin Eddie Mambo live. Um, and she's got a whole bunch of friends um, and neighbors in her community in the Bronx. Um, so we're going to start by um, uh, showing uh, the show open, um, which uh, is seems like a good way to start because it's how we start every, ep every episode. Um, and you'll hear more from uh, my colleagues, Mia Olufemi, Jorge Aguirre, Darren Bristow, and Dave Thomas, you can guess who might be the director. More from everyone in a moment. But Ellen, uh, Ellen, yeah. Ellen, right, right before you begin the show open, I wanted to um, remind everyone or let everyone know that if you would like to have captions available, um, we can accommodate that. And all you will need to do is enable that setting in the box marked live transcription or CC in the Zoom menu near the chat function. So that will be available to anyone who will need that. And then Ellen, take it away. Thank you, Sue. That's a great reminder. I have seen several episodes now because I do want to point out that already Alma's Way is now streaming free on PBS Kids. And we'll remind you of that again at the end of our webinar. But to start off, Ellen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to have each of the show team members give us a little bit of background on their own personal life and how they came into animation. Maybe everyone take about two minutes for that and then we'll start talking about the show. Will do, thank you, Sue. Um, so my current job is, uh, as mentioned, executive producer for Alma's Way, but I'm also chief creative officer for Fred Rogers Productions um, and executive producer on Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Odd Squad and um, Don Quixote, which premiered in May on PBS Kids, um, as well as Through the Woods, which is a series of shorts, which was nominated for an Annie in, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, um, On uh, uh, that's also airing on PBS Kids. I started my career in live action, um, working on a show called Reading Rainbow, and got into animation. Um, uh, now it's like 20 years ago, but the first animated show I worked on was Cyber Chase. Excellent, thank you. And um, before I'm going to introduce Jorge in just a moment, but first of all, I would like to remind or let everyone know that um, you can submit questions. We'll be having, we'll be answering questions. We'll have a Q and A in about the last 10 to 20 minutes of the webinar. So please, uh, while we're talking, submit your questions and then we will do our best to answer as many as possible. So I would like to then um, introduce Jorge uh, Jorge is the head writer on the show, and perhaps you can tell us a bit about yourself, Jorge. Sure, thanks. Thanks a lot, too. Um, yeah, my name is Jorge. I'm the head writer of Alma's Way. I also write graphic novels on the side. Um, my beginning was in the, in the industry was in LA. I was hired to, to work on Go Diego Go. Um, and I sort of started off with Go Diego Go to Dora. And also while I was in LA, I sold a show to Disney Junior called Goldie and Bear. Then I moved back east 
and I've been working kind of as a story editor, freelance writer, and now a head writer here. And uh, I'm Colombian American and from Midwest, and now I'm in Jersey. Excellent, thank you. All right, and then I would like to introduce Mia. Uh, Mia has a wonderful name that I will not pronounce the full name because I might get it wrong. Um, Mia is the supervising producer on the show. She has a very big job and I'd like her to tell us a bit about what she does and where she comes from. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Olubumi Mia Olufemi. Um, I'm, as Sue said, I'm the supervising producer of Alma's Way, really bridging um, the space between where script and animation and music and all the other things that go into making a show uh, do. Um, and uh, I started in animation really roundabout. I wanted to be a young adult fiction editor and couldn't find a job in publishing. Um, and then I saw a production assistant job become available at WGBH for Arthur, which I grew up watching and loved. And I sang the theme song at my interview and I did not get hired for the job but they liked me so much and maybe had pity on me that they created a position for me. So um, started at GBH on uh, doing scripting for Curious George and random production assistant for uh, Arthur and other um, live action shows. And then I was the producer on Molly of Denali uh, through season one. And now I'm at FRP working with uh, Ellen and all these beautiful people on Alma's Way. Fantastic, thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Darren. Risto and Darren is the executive creative director and supervising producer of Alma's for Alma's Way. And he is with a studio called Pipeline Studios. And Darren, tell us a bit about Pipeline and your Pipeline's role on the show, and then tell us about yourself. All right, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Very honored to be here and talk all things Alma. Uh, this is my 27th year in the business, and I really was just someone who liked to draw. And my ambition as a youngster was to work for Mad Magazine. Uh, and I just kind of kept pursuing drawing and my parents were, uh, I guess they saw the, the spark in me and kind of guided me towards uh, animation. So I started, uh, my entry point in the industry was a, a 2D character designer uh, way back on this thing called paper. Uh, and then as you know, the dawn of technology in the 90s, I transitioned into CG uh, for series, still kind of being a designer, but using different technology. And then I did a few years in beautiful, sunny Los Angeles doing visual effects. Uh, and then after three years or three decades in this industry, I've kind of been someone who's navigated almost all the positions in a production pipeline. So at Pipeline uh, Studios, I kind of hold a dual role of a creative director managing our portfolio of development brands. Um, but then I kind of shift into supervising producer. So on Alma, I'm actually the supervising producer. But when Ellen brought the show to Pipeline to look at, I, I kind of threw, she had a great recipe kind of in place already. So I kind of just added some spice into it. So uh, for now, I'm actually the supervising producer and uh, I get to work with all these people here and keep Dave Thomas in line. Well, then we should uh, move on to Dave Thomas, who's the series director, one of the series directors of the show. I know you have a couple, but you're the supervising series director, I believe. And Dave is also at Pipeline Studios. Thanks, Sue. And Darren, you can try to keep me in line, but I will be un not kept in line. I'm online captable, if that's a word. Well, it is now. So, uh, hi, I'm Dave. Uh, as Sue said, I'm one of the directors of this fantastic show that uh, I am so loving every day on. It's been one of the most enjoyable, cool, fun, collaborative experiences I've ever had in my career. Um, I actually... I uh, like to say that I stumbled into animation. Uh, my background was live action. Uh, so I've studied film, video, photography, um, way back when there was a thing called multi-image. We studied multi-image. And uh, I started dabbling in stop motion, which I found A, uh, I've always liked it as a kid, you know, Gumby and all those old shows and the Rankin Bass uh, Christmas specials. I found I, I liked it. I seemed to have a, a, a skill at it. And what I really liked was that it was like the world of live action with cameras and sets and little tiny actors who don't complain. And the control of animation, it was the best of both worlds. Um, I ended up directing a bunch of series, specials, show opens uh, at another studio. Um, worked in 
I've animated live act. I've stop motion human beings, um, puppets, uh, a dead lobster once, which was quite an experience. His antenna fell off. I had to hot glue it back on mid scene. It was that was something. Uh, and then I sort of branched out into other forms of animation, cutout, two D. Uh, I I like doing a lot of things. I've written. I've story edited, I've worked in development. And then about uh, five or six years ago, I had the joy of joining Pipeline and meeting meeting Darren. I think we spent our whole interview for me, my interview, talking Star Trek, I think, Darren, if that's correct. And we bonded on Star Trek. Um, yeah, no, it's been great. And working on this show, uh, it's right up my alley in terms of messaging and the design and the look. and. My co, my co director, Sean Sellis, great guy. We, we uh, sort of finish other sentences and we have a great organic sort of uh, working system between the two of us. And it's been quite a cool ride. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that, that is great. Um, I think everyone watching this can see that Ellen has put together a quite an amazing team of people. And that is only the beginning because. There's an, a, a really amazing creator behind this show. Um, her name is Sonia Manzano. And I would love Ellen to tell you about Sonia, how this show, the genesis of the show, how Alma's Way came to reality and um, take it away, Ellen. Thank you, Sue. Uh, well, Sonia Manzano, who uh, I'm sure the name rings a bell, was Maria on Sesame Street for several decades. And uh, about, well, in 2016, um, we were connected with her uh, by Linda Siminski at PBS, who many of you probably know. Linda had said to Sonia at some point before that, several years before, um, what if you made a TV show? Like, would you want to tell us what kind of stories would you want to tell? Because um, Sonia had written some books that were kind of based on stories from her childhood. And so Linda gave her that little nudge and Sonia uh, ran with it. And she um, had the idea to create this show about uh, a little girl from the Bronx named Alma and set it in the world of her friends and her family and um, her community, um, which being in the Bronx, being in New York City is a really diverse community um, and really obviously steeped in Puerto Rican culture um, and just that is the world of the show. And what she um, said to us was that she wanted to, um, in the very first meeting when we talked about it, you know, I said earlier, this is a show about critical thinking and problem solving. And the way that Sonia expressed that initially was, I want kids to know that they have a mind and they can use it. Mm -hmm. And that just really resonated for me. And um, so this idea of how do we help kids think things through? How do we um, this is a show that's for children ages four to six. So it's not young preschool. It's sort of the older edge of preschool. And, you know, probably many of you know a lot about young children and like a two or three year old, a four year old, a six year old, they're all growing and changing so quickly. Um, there's just a lot to, uh, first of all, a lot to work with in terms of thinking about what's going on in kids' lives in the, in the age of your target audience, but also, um, uh, just a lot of opportunity. So kids in our audience, um, their, you know, their worlds are expanding. Um, they are um, encountering more choices in their day-to-day -day lives. Most of the time, a little different during the pandemic. Um, kids have been home more, obviously. But um, that idea of kids uh, who are, you know, just starting to go to school, maybe going to a different kind of preschool or kindergarten situation, um, they have more moments in their day when they have to figure stuff out. And there may not be a grown up there to help every minute the way that they would have um, been more likely to have when they were um, toddlers. So um, that's who the show is for and sort of what we think about. And Sonia, as I said, had this, um, had a draft of the Bible um, when we started working with her. And um, obviously that was just an easy yes when we got the um, email from Linda saying, would you be interested in talking to Sonia Manzano about an idea for a show? Yes, clearly. And um, the idea was crystal clear. And I started working with Sonia, developing it with her um, in 2016. 
in 2017, um, I brought on Jorge uh, as uh, a writer to work with us on the Bible and in development. And he co-wrote the pilot script with Sonia. The pilot script, which did that is an episode that didn't air. We just did it as a pilot. Um, it turned into about three different stories, maybe three and a half. <laughs> so there was a lot to work with there, which is what you learn in the pilot. Um, and uh, brought on Pipeline um, after we got the pilot deal with PBS and so on. So that's sort of the general starting, starting of how we got started. So it's been quite a journey so far. Like, For sure, and a joyful <laughs> one too. And it, and it seems like, you know what I love about this show is when I've, I've watched a number of episodes, it feels so authentic. These are real kids, um, family members, mixed family, it, it's so diverse. And there's a, a dynamic energetic feeling to it that is so beautiful. And I can see how, you know, you have reality there, reality and characters. And I keep using the word authenticity. Now I grew up in Colorado. I did not grow up in a big city, but it feels like you've developed this sense of like a neighborhood and all the interesting people not characters, but people who live in a neighborhood that kids interact with and they get to see. So let's talk a bit about Alma's world and her neighborhood. Who would like to, you know, Jorge, maybe you start out and then others just jump in and, and share your thoughts and, and some of the processes and the ideas and things. Sure, I think you picked up on something that's really important to us, which is the realness of the show, which begins like with the, the genesis of the show, being inspired by Sonia Manzano's childhood in the Bronx. So right away, you know that we're gonna be setting the show in a real place. And because we're in a real place, we have real people. And because we have real people, we're telling real stories and giving, you know, talking about real solutions to real issues for kids. And to make the Bronx come alive, we, we try to reflect like what the Bronx looks like. And, what Alma's family looks like. And that comes down to like very specific details. Even for example, if we have multiple Latino, we have multiple Latino characters like Mexican and Puerto Rican, Cuban, and everybody has, every culture of Latinos has a different like sound, different music, different food, different way, you know, different words. And we try to like stay as accurate as we can to keep the whole thing feel real. At Mia, um, as the supervising producer on this show, I can imagine as you're going for this authenticity and this feeling of a real world, what did you do a lot of research or um, oh, yeah. went into developing the world of the show? A lot. I think that, you know, Jorge and Sonia and Ellen really, as Jorge said, wanted to make sure that this felt real, that we were set in the Bronx. Um, and so they did organize a trip to New York City um, with Pipeline and Dave and Darren was there. And, you know, they went around to the Bronx and looked at buildings and neighborhoods and the elevated six, tra uh, six train platform, which is, you know, in behind me um, and, and really instilled that into, you know, the design, but also as Jorge said, um, we really wanted to make sure that this looked like a real place with real people. And so when we were designing the incidentals, I did a lot of research on who lives in the Bronx. We know that there's a huge Latino population. There's a huge African-American population there. Um, but there's also, you know, a huge South Asian population there. And so Ruffy and her family being from Bangladesh is true to you know, the demographics of the Bronx. And, you know, when we were designing the incidentals, uh, I, I really wanted to make sure that anybody who we saw on the street was somebody that you would, or anybody who you saw on the show would look like somebody you saw on the street. So um, wrote a huge list of people I'm not used to seeing in cartoons. Um, and that's, you know, indigenous folks, that's um, people with you know, who use assistive technology, that's pregnant women, that's, you know, different types of children, um, people with, you know, different skin conditions, anything like that, um, LGBTQIA plus folks, and gave that list to Pipeline. And every time we got a design, the question was, who is this person and where do they come from? And Pipeline rose to the occasion and designed, you know, some beautiful incidentals 
who are so unique. There are West African people. There's a beautiful Filipino family, you know, who come in and out. There's a poor woman who can never uh, make the train, but there are also those quirky characters like Chicken Man and a guy with a fish head that, you know, is based on somebody Ellen actually saw in a corner in New York City. So we're really trying to make the show look as authentic and fun as possible. Well, it seems also that for kids today, um, especially kids who don't live in the city or live in the city or in a big city, it's how wonderful them for them to see this wonderfully dis different group of people all be together and having stories and unique personalities. And it, to me, it makes it seem like for kids, it makes the world um, more inviting and less, you know, when people are afraid or nervous of something that's different by making it more familiar, it, it's something more that can more embraced. And um, I love that about it. I think some of those back, some of those incidental characters are so interesting. They could have their own episode, some of them. They're so fascinating. Um, Dave, uh, Dave and Darren, are there uh, things you have to say about as you were helping design and build out the neighborhood, what went into it? Well, I was gonna say, um, sort of latching onto what Mia and Jorge have been saying, um, when we are uh, boarding the show, in our minds, uh, we have an actual film crew in Alma's Bronx shooting the show. Mm. We approach it very cinematically, very, you know, we've got Bronx location permits, uh, which is way easier in an animated world than the real world, let me tell you. The, the fees are way lower. They're way more accommodating. Uh, so shooting the show has got a lot less headache than a live action production. Um, and the approach, that, the reason behind this is that we didn't want this to feel like a, you know, a more standard 2D show. We are in the show. We want to make it immersive. There's the story and the community and the characters in front of you that you're watching. But there's all this stuff implied behind you. Uh, again, it's the it's the re, it's the sense of you mentioned authenticity earlier. It's that it's that realism that we are striving for in the show. With I mean, it's an animated series, so we have kind of a we keep change, it's like a, a seven percent enhanced feeling to performance or to you know for for certainly for color. It's a very vibrant looking show, um, and you know, and I think it was Ellen or me was, uh, way back way back in the start. Maybe it was Sonia. So it's the Bronx as Alma sees it. So it's wow. it's extra colorful. It's extra interesting. Every, there's a there's a newness to everything because she's so young and that helps you know she, as she's sort of navigating uh her world and that's a great that, that's where we jumped off because like great. yeah it was that trip it was actually the trip to the bronx where we're like we have to bring the audience on this trip so when when like i said when when ellen and sonia kind of had the recipe already uh somewhat in place and she brought to, uh, to pipeline you know, we take the technologies as serious as the uh, creativity. So we're like, what can we, what innovations can we add to this to actually elevate the stories we want to tell? So we came up with some ideas that actually, uh, you know, turn 2D paintings into 3D sets. So we could actually take the, you know, the audience inside the frame and like, you want to go around that corner in the Bronx, that specific street, not a problem. We can, we can do that. So, you know, stuff that enhance and just bring that, that undercurrent of realism and, you know, oh, authenticity to the surface. The 2D, 3D mix, again, allows us for more cinematic camera work, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not as restricted or constrained. We can do, like, the, the opening shot of, 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 of the open is a great case in point where you, we are flying through overhead of the, uh, of the community at the busy intersection. I noticed that. I felt that immersive. And it creates a deep immersion into, into the environment. It's not flat. It's very dimensional, which I know is um, a, a lot more complex in producing that, but the quality really comes through for that, I would say. And what I love about what I was noticing as I was studying it, because I, I love watching animation and then in my mind, I start wondering, okay, how did they do that? And I start analyzing it. And, and what I love is, you know, so often when 3D is being used, merged with 2D, it jumps out at you. And when that happens, it almost, breaks the reality or breaks it. And this feels so fluid 
that you're not even aware. And, and to that point, can we talk about the characters, the performance animation and the facial animation? I, I thought the designs, like, let's talk a little bit about the character designs because I feel that like their eyes, they very, are very, em their emotion comes through and they really connect with you. Um, and it's almost like you feel like you wanna be friends with them. That's what I feel with these characters. I agree. And I think that um, this is something that's so crucial to the show and the mix of, you know, we do social emotional learning is where you would put this on like a curriculum framework of what is Alma's way about. It falls under um, social emotional learning. And really what you need in that is super expressive characters. And with Alma, with the focus on her and that you know, for a young child navigating, you know, how to figure stuff out often has to do with how do I manage my emotions so that I can think things through. Mm -hmm. And when um, one of the things that Pipeline did that was so amazing from the beginning is that they took the concept art that we had developed during the pilot phase or before the pilot phase rather, um, just the, 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 you know, several, probably we had about four um, character images, Alma, Mami, and Chacho, oh, whose name was different then. Uh, I forget what it was. Chulo, was it Chulo? Chulo. 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 Yeah. Which that's a whole nother conversation. It means something not, not ready for, not safe for work in one of the Spanish speaking countries. It is a slang term for something. I don't even remember what, but it's not good. <laughs> anyway, we had to change it. So uh, the pictures, uh, the concept art was those three characters and we had about four or five poses all together, I think. And um, I think three background images. <clears throat> and Pipeline took that and as part of their, you know, materials pitch to do the pilot with us, they animated Alma's face and gave a hint of what we might expect. And that was one of the things that made me go, okay, yeah. This is the studio for this show. And I will turn it over to Darren from there. I'll say thank you for that setup, that's great. Uh, yeah, I and mean, really, well, you brought characters that, like I said, we just assessed it for like, what can we take this to the next level? So it was just about taking some of our rig uh, innovations and really doing a lot of R&D to just add that little extra, you know, uh, 3D depth and dimensionality. So you see those subtle nuances. So you really feel like you, like you said, you know these characters, right? So it was really about just enhancing, making them feel like real people, right? And, and that's also, sorry, just in terms of the culture, the the, the Puerto Ricanness of this, you know, this was super important to Sonia that the characters really reflect who they are. They're all of the physical characteristics, which in a, when a show is more cartoony in, in design, you lose some of that if, you know, if, if the mouth or the nose is just like a single line, you know, if there's the more minimal, the more stylized features become, well, maybe not files, the more minimal features become, the less they have the characteristics of the people of who that person might be. So with Alma, one of the choices um, with Sonia was how do we best reflect those traits? Because that's where we're reflecting for viewers here's someone, you know, here's Alma, here's what Alma looks like. And some kids who are gonna watch this and say, wow, she looks like me. And I haven't seen a lot of people who look like me on TV before. And that is another piece of the, the, the goals for this show. And um, so uh, that is something else that Pipeline really um, stepped up with um, when it comes to all of the character animation and all of the, the design work that Mia was talking about earlier. That's excellent. Well, and I saw how how beautiful the animation is um, and in performance, but in storytelling, Jorge, as you were writing these characters, um, I noticed that, you know, can you tell us a bit about Alma? I noticed that she, she does something where she makes a decision or she has done something and then she thinks about it. And it's almost, tells us about that. I love that technique you're doing with her. Yeah, we call that the think through and every episode has a think through and it's sort of what we all do subconsciously, but uh, like Ellen often says, it's like we, what we do is we unpack all these moments and try to connect like the breadcrumbs from thought to thought to thought. So 
Alma has an issue and she kind of flashes back to moments earlier in the episode where, oh, you know, I did this thing. I wonder, if, is that why he's mad? Oh, wait a minute, then I did that. Oh, and then, you know, the nice thing about Alma, she messes up a lot in a great way. So we like, get to learn a lot through her because we're trying to teach critical thinking. So some of the think throughs are reviewing things that she's done. Some are imagining possible solutions. So if she's playing with her friends with a, a small box that's not big enough for everybody to fit in, she tries to imagine, well, how do I come up with a box big enough for all my friends to play in? And she might imagine a gigantic box, but that's not a real solution. And then she might imagine from there to maybe I could have more than one box. And then that leads her to the solution. And basically what we do is just unpack that moment where you make a decision, where you come to some sort of revelation. And it's it's pretty fun. And, and the style that Pipeline came up with for the Think Cruise is really neat because she kind of watches her thoughts, which is really nice. Were there challenges, would you say, Jorge, in developing the characters? And, you know, with Mother and her sister and, you know, the different characters as you put together the cast and the personalities, were there uh, certain things you were looking for or certain challenges that came about? Well, one thing with the adults is Sonia always said, like, early on that she didn't want, like, idealized adults who would swoop in and solve the kids' problems. Like, they're in the background and they're there to help out, but we wanted the adults to kind of have their own personalities, not be super saccharine and idealized versions of adults. But, you know, they have their own thing. You know, they, mommy has a music, teaches music. Papi is a vet with a vet show. They do their thing and they're there to help, but they kind of stay in the background. And I think the challenge with our show and the challenge with any show that you write is trying to give every character a different voice. So like when we're writing scripts, uh, my, my junior story editor and I, Dana Chan, will read the scripts out loud and we often ask ourselves, can you move a line to a different character and it still sounds the same? And if it does, then we didn't do a good job at making every character sound a little different. And we'll tweak that line so that only that character can say that line, only that character can have that voice or that point of view. I also want to just to piggyback off of Jorge, really give a huge shout out to our actors. Um, they are, you know, Ellen made a conscious decision to uh, cast in New York City. So mm -hmm. we are um, pulling from a really diverse and talented pool of actors, um, several of them from the Latin act acting community, um, casted by uh, Elaine Del Valle and our um, our voice director, Holly Gregory, is not super script sacred, sorry, Jorge, but like, <laughs> you know, when it comes to when it comes to expressions and things like that, you know, we really rely on our actors to add that flavor um, to the script. So, you know, Summer is such a natural, she's from the Bronx, born and raised and has that accent. Um, Gloria, if folks saw the episode Beatbox Big Time, who plays um, Tia Gloria, uh, sorry, Sharon Montero, who plays Tia Gloria, has such a great raspy voice. She was in radio and she's such an effervescent personality and she brings that to the show. But then you also have people like, you know, Victor who Cruz, who plays Frankie Fortfeet, who, you know, is a beatboxer and a rapper and also a voice, um, you know, voice talent um coach and you know they bring stuff like he is puerto rican and he would he he one day he said you know oh mommy bendicion that's like a you know like a hey mommy like blessing see you that is authentic to puerto rican culture that was an ad lib that we've now written into our our special so they bring a lot of really um quirky things to life in in the already uh the already rich writing that Dana and Jorge and the writers are putting together, they they just add that final touch. Well, I'll add though also that as Dana and I get all these records and we hear what the actors sound like, we too are changing the way that their voices sound because the actors are inspiring us with their performances. Wow. And I was gonna say for the, anim the animators, uh, the personalities that have been written and the fantastic voice talent really is inspirational uh, source material that glows for the animation team. Um, and where the animation team is concerned, 
we sort of guide them or tell them to think themselves not as animators, but as performers who animate, because there's a different mindset that goes on there. I mean, you can animate something, but we're asking the animators to be to embody the characters and bring them to life in, in that regard. And with these, with the scripts, the great scripts and the voice talent, uh, you know, there's a lot, we're all, we're all heavy lifting, but it sure helps. It, it really, really is uh, helpful. Well, that, auth that authenticity definitely comes through in the voices. I love the fact you're using real kids. You know, sometimes when adults are voicing kids, it just doesn't feel authentic. And, um, you know, along with that authenticity, the music is so amazing. Can you tell us about the music? The, the, uh, the, the main title song I know is written by, Melanie, Ellen, you can talk about that a bit, a very famous composer. Sure, yeah. Um, Sonia called in a favor to Lin-Manuel Miranda and asked if he would um, be able to write a song uh, for the show and he very kindly agreed. So Lynn and Bill Sherman, uh, who is a, a longtime uh, collaborator with uh, Lin-Manuel, um, wrote the theme song and um, it was a uh, produced, written and produced by Lin-Manuel and Bill, and then performed by Flaco Navaja, who uh, sings the uh, the lead song in it, I guess. And then uh, Summer Rose Castillo, who plays Alma, who is uh, just turned nine years old, uh, like a month and a half ago. Um, so when we started recording with her, she had just turned eight. Um, she plays Summer, or she plays Alma, her name is Summer, and she raps in the theme song and is amazing. This kid is super, super talented, really smart. And to the, to your point, Sue, about kid performers for a second, the thing that sets apart a, a performer like Summer who had not had a job like this before, like she was interested in it, but she hadn't done it. But what is interesting to me is watching how kids in the booth, the kids who play um, Andre and, um, uh, Lucas and Rafia, they have questions. They want to know what's going on. One of the first times, or the first time that Summer did a session with Holly, um, her first record for the show, uh, Holly said, do you have any questions for me? And Summer was like, yes. And she had like two or three questions. And a lot of times like a more shy kid is not going to do that. But the kid who is really right for carrying a show and we have in the first season for Alma's Way it's 40 half hours for PBS kids that's wow. 80 11 minute stories that is some work yes. that is a lift for a kid and their family and the what Summer is really into about it is what tells us also partially why she's the kid for the for the project because she really cares about her performance and can think about what she is performing um, but to get back to the music, I'm actually going to throw it over to Mia to talk about the, um, the, the score and episodic music. Yeah, so um, I think just keeping with authenticity and who Sonia is, she is a, um, you know, American born, New York born, Puerto Rican. And so it was really important to us that the whole sound of the show embodied that background. So it is a mix of different Latin genres, um, traditional Puerto Rican music, like aguinaldos and, um, you know, son and bomba and plena, but you also hear hip hop. You're also hearing opera, uh, like in our Nogo Mofongo episode, Mami sings about smashing the platanos to, uh, you know, an opera song. Um, and you're hearing jazz and you're hearing, you know, classical and all of this, this beautiful mishmash that is the sound of New York um, is in our score. And that was created by a, a musical team, uh, Asher Lenz and Steven Scratt. Um, and they um, brought on another composer. Um, her name is Fabiola Mendez. Um, it was really important to us that our composition um, include uh, you know, real Latin musicians. And so that was the challenge was how will you bring 
um, authentic Puerto Rican and Latin flair to the score. And they proposed to us to bring on Fabiola, who is Puerto Rican, but also an incredible quattro player um, and singer. And she plays several other instruments. And the three of them have just, I mean, the music is so good. We hear, I, I think today I was listening to something that sounded like dubstep and like chill music. There's, you know, a great um, scene in Alma the Artist where Alma and Andre are kind of, you know, butting heads about, you know, painting a mural and the, the scene is set to a tango, right? Cause you're hearing oh, wow. them push and pull and go back and forth. And, and they're able to do these really clever things um, with music. If Alma drops something or, make a mis or makes a mistake there's like a jazz horn blast. Um, and so the music on the show is incredibly sophisticated. I don't think it's anything that you would normally think would be in a preschool show, um, but it does such a great job of not only representing the world and the emotions that Alma is feeling and ex experiencing, but just providing us with this super fun soundscape to play in. Fantastic. It, it, the music is fabulous. And I know when you're animating the music, that's more time. It takes more time, it takes more attention, it takes more planning, but it pays off, that's for sure. I was gonna say, uh, we are at, we should, we have a few questions that have been posed. We will, you know, we'll answer some questions. Um, viewers, please add some more questions to our list. We have four right now, and then we can come back and continue talking. Um, but I wanna be sure we get to these questions. And uh, I see, here's one from Samantha Miller. She says, I love how Alma's Way is so authentically steeped in culture. What are the best practices for pitching a series that's rooted in a culture that the listener may or may not be a part of? So Ellen, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, I think the key, you know, this is an interesting thing. I think that the, the most important thing is the, the person who's representing their experience, who is part of that pitch. And um, I think that as with all storytelling, it's the how you tell the story in a way that feels like you're being told a story. It's not that stuff is being explained to you. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I would explain it. Jorge, do you have anything to, to add to that? I do. Um, it's not a direct parallel to the show, but I'm a fan of like explaining as little as possible and like focusing on stories. And so in our Mofongo episode, we could have done like explain what a what Mofongo is. And instead we just mention it, you see it. And then there's a line, I think Alma says something like, oh, the taste of smashed plantains and garlic and this stuff. Mm. And it's just kind of incorporated organically into that moment. And I, I really appreciate that we didn't have to stop and be like, so listen, folks, the way you make Mofongo and like, you know, I just like it when it's more organic and it's about the story. That makes sense. That, I think that's great. Thank you for answering that. Um, and we have a question from, I, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Rossiter. It says, are any of the characters in the show based on anyone you know? Let's say whoever wants to answer that, or there might be a few of you who want to answer that. So we do have we do yeah. have one um, Granny Issa uh, who is played by none other than Sonia Manzano, and um, so you will be seeing an animated Sonia. She's a great character. Uh, we pitched her as a flight attendant who travels all over the world collecting dances, um, and she voiced herself. It was great. I have um, lots of incriminating videos of Sonia dancing in the booth. <laughs> share with our social team <laughs> but yeah so that's that's one and there's a couple other characters that come to mind there's uh eddie mambo who is almost next door cousin he's inspired by a combination of a cousin of sonia's and also uh, a kid from her old neighborhood there's also an episode uh called song of summer with like a famous singer and it's inspired by a real story that happened to sonia when she was a kid in willie colon came over to her place. He was in the Bronx. He was a kid too. And he played some music at their place. And that spun, that kind of inspired us to tell a story in that, in that way too. Nice. 
I'm sure there's a few others too, because <laughs> a lot of this gets spun out from stories that Sonia tells us. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm gonna grab that, you know, that sort of thing. There are a lot of characters in the cast, just the background characters I know. So you have a very rich cast, so. Um, well, and the Bronx is a, ca is a character as well, right? And so when we went on that tour, there's actual buildings where Sonia was like, and here's where I, you know, I, I bought stuff here and I went to school here and, oh, I lived here for a little while. So th those really? buildings are actually in it, right? Oh, I love that. That's wonderful. And the train is a character. The train looks very authentic. I did not grow up in the Bronx, so I'm not sure. Can you tell us a bit about the train? Ellen, do you want to take one? Oh, well, I was going to say, we, yeah, it's the six train, uh, which is, you know, the real, re the train for uh, one of the trains that goes to the Bronx and is famously the one that goes to a lot of Puerto Rican neighborhoods. Sonia tells a story about how it used to be, I think in the seventies or eighties, they would say the six trains, the six train to the Bronx in Puerto Rico. And um, so it's really, it was really important that, um, you know, when we talk about this authenticity and realness of the show, one of the things that as a uh, former New Yorker was really important to me was to make sure that the subway train looked like the real subway train because I hate it when something's generic and with all due respect to Toronto, when I watch a movie and it's supposed to be set in New York and they get on a subway and it is not the subway, it is Toronto because it says Young Street right there, <laughs> come on. So we actually you know, made a deal with the MTA, the New York City uh, Transit Authority and we get them to approve all of our designs for the oh, subway wow. and for the uniform so that we can make sure that for kids who are watching, who live in the city, who visit the city, that they know that's my train. And I think that's another piece of representing culture that for kids who live in the city, like public transportation is a way of life. And it's not so much for kids who don't live in the city, but all kids love a train. So um, that was why we really wanted that. And, and um, Dave can speak to how we incorporate it into just all kinds of shots. It's like, it's always there in the background somewhere. Like the trolley, right? Exactly. Actually, you know, for me, um, my dad and I had always planned to build a train set in the basement and we never got around to it. So now I kind of consider the six train, my train set. Yeah. In the oh my God, we have to make that product. I'm just saying. <laughs> Oh, when that happens, which sign is me up. up day one, I'll be, I'll be think that the Bronx, the six train, <laughs> just saying. Uh, no, but we we try we uh when we came back from the Bronx trip, uh, and we uh we shot I think just over a thousand photos between all of us clicking everything, uh two thousand there you go, uh we uh Sean and I sat down and we did kind of an overhead map of the neighborhood. And we do everything we can. I mean, obviously, sometimes there's a little bit of bending of where characters coming from now and then because of story needs. But I would say 98.9% .9 of the time, we are following the legitimacy of the neighborhood we've created. Because in our mind, again, it's the authenticity. This is a real place. So if you're going to go to the vet clinic, it's around that corner in that way. And we keep it consistent that way through uh, the boards. So we have our train track set up. Um, but we you know we all love the train so much and it's so integral we've added so now I think if you can see an overhead we have train tracks going everywhere so we can get great shots of the train in the background of the park over here by the bodega uh, it just adds a lovely flavor to the scenes and a sense of that urban life always existing just outside of camera frame of characters on their to and fro of their daily lives plus it's a great sound too and it's something that was really special to Sonia. She mentioned, you know, being a teenager or a kid and leaning out of her window and watching the six train roll by. And so we try to we try to honor that. I love that. We have a, a few more questions here. We are getting near the end of our time. So if there are other questions, pop them in the box. We have two about writing that I'm going to combine into one. Um, uh, essentially. Uh, do you have a writer's room? If so, how many writers? And is it virtual or in person? Uh, and then how long does it take to produce one script? And okay. <laughs> a lot of questions in this. And are you using focus groups of kids during the process? I can answer like 80% of this question. So um, 
we don't have a writer's room. We we have two and we work on a freelancers model. So we have two in-house writers, myself as head writer and Dana Chan as our junior story editor. And then we had a pool of about, I think it was like, I counted like 18 or so freelancers. I mean, we had 80 stories to do for season one. And we also wanted to have a pretty diverse pool of writers. And that was one of the great things about pandemic and working virtually is that we were able to get writers from, from LA, from New York, from North Carolina, from Canada. And we were able to pull from a really great pool of writers, but um, everything was done virtually. You know, we would meet with the freelancers online and we would, um, and we would do everything virtually. And then so, how long, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say, no, please go ahead. And then how long does it take from That's premise nice. to record draft? about four months, four and a half months, and then from record draft to final animation, uh, how long is that, Dave or Mia? About two months. Uh, <laughs> I think it's more than that. I, I, think, I, I think it's more like four months, five yeah. months, I think. Yeah, because it has to be yeah, There's important. a little bit of an overlap, but you're right. I mean, upon delivery, the boarding process alone, just the boarding process is, four weeks and then we have the animatic process which is several more weeks so and the designs so it does you know it follows it's a lot of work it's a lot that of work. goes into a single episode <clears throat> ashley payton asked a question which is sort of in the same vein she's asking um, well she was asking about the writing process sorry ashley so we just answered that uh, jenna or jenny jenny um asked why did you choose to have alma talk to camera i think that's a really good question um, well, I'll, I'll, uh, the reason for that was that the way that Sonia had, the th thought that Sonia had in her original Bible was um, helping a kid think things through in their heads. So not so much, um, it was to spark that internal dialogue. So how do we do that? So two things came to mind. One was this idea of the think through, which started as pausing time to figure out what's going on. But it also felt like for Alma to be able to have the viewer as a confidant, um, not in a way like with Daniel Tiger where he pauses for the viewer and sort of there's that expectation of a reply. It was much more in the way of um, uh, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> <laughs> the show that I was watching a lot of the the fall that I started working with Sonia was Fleabag and that intimacy with the camera of just looking and sometimes what Alma does is she just gives a look to camera she just takes and is like either like or like or something as well as the little conversational things because it's that the viewer always needs to know what's going on with Alma and the trick of it is that when we get to the think through, she's actually talking to herself. She talks to the viewer a little bit, but she's mostly talking to herself and trying to remember and reflect or imagine something. Mm -hmm. And this is the animation for the think through has been a really amazing journey to figure out because there's a lot about the nuance of those moments that we've worked through in the in the first part of the season, but I think we're still discovering ways and new ways that we would like to use them in the future of um, of how like Alma doesn't look so much at what she doesn't look at what she's remembering because she's remembering it. So it's in her head. And there's a, like 70 different layers of how we try to reinforce that. But so she 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 gets into a thinking pose and she's like, huh? And you see the memory, the, the whatever she's thinking about change. And sometimes when she changes thought, she'll change her body language. And uh, mm -hmm. there's just so much to that that we want to model for kids watching how mm -hmm. to problem solve with yourself. Right. So that <laughs> talking to camera is all part of that intimacy, even though what happens in the think through is very different from the rest of it. I see that that comes through so beautifully too. And that is so important to model for children, for kids, how to, like she is, if they see the way she thinks through a problem and questions it and thinks about it and then comes up with her solutions, 
it's teaching kids how to do that, which is fantastic because they definitely, that's great learning for them. Um, we're getting, okay, again, we are almost out of time, but let's have, we have another question here. I think, I'm sorry, I have my reading glasses on and it's kind of small. I think it's Lillian. I apologize again if I got your name wrong. Um, has asked, have you ever killed a script or episode? And if so, why? Uh, I can answer this, if that's okay. So we have not killed anything that's gone past premise. Um, usually by the time we do a, prem a premise, it's been talked about internally. It goes out to the wider group. Everybody believes in the story and it, it tends to go forward from that. So I don't think we've ever killed anything after premise. Okay. You know, it's interesting, I'm reading the chat Wow, everyone, thank you so much for participating in the chat so well. Uh, some participants, I don't know if you've been able to see it because you're uh, busy answering questions, but we just have wonderful comments. People are saying hello, they're loving what um, the authenticity. Um, one, um, Samantha Miller says she's a musical theater fan and she felt something very familiar about the song. Uh, people are loving the panel and feeling the authenticity and the passion all of you have for the show is really coming through and um, and loving the representative, you know, the representative nature of the characters. Uh, uh, they think she's, uh, Samantha also says, Alma's giggle is the cutest thing ever. Yes to kid performers. Um, wow, thank you everyone. We really appreciate you participating and sharing via chat. Oh, and here are a couple more quick questions. Is everyone okay if we if we end up running a minute or two late? Are you all right with that? Okay, okay. Um, Jerry Bryce asks, in your animation process, how does sheet timing and lip sync assignment on the exposure sheets work in your animation production pipeline? So Darren and Dave, that would be for you. Are you using you know the I'll sheet timing one. process, lip assignment? We are not. No, there's no real time to do the actual sheet timing to it. The animators, when they get their scenes, we have kind of a huge meeting with the directors and the teams and act through some shots. When they get their uh, scene to animate, they have all the materials and characters ready to start and they have the audio right in there for them. So as they're working, just like I'm sitting here, they, they're listening and acting out and becoming those characters on the spot. Right, like a timeline of yeah. audio right there. Well, I think that also comes through and gives you more realistic dialogue for the animator rather than a sheet timer, which is great when it's going overseas to Asia where they don't speak English or the production companies necessarily or India. But, and I know with your rigs for Alma, for all the characters, you have more than just a few mouth shapes. You, so the animators are working the, the character's face to create those expressions. I helped answer that question, <laughs> but <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's so much more than traditional sheet timing and lip assignment. And that really comes across in the beautiful animation. Um, and then Ashley uh, Payton uh, said, what advice would you give uh, to, in, to an aspiring, to aspiring or maybe inspiring children's television writers and producers? Oh, advice. <laughs> There's lots of it. Ellen, you wanna, and Mia maybe jump in on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things. I think that, I think that uh, one of the things that sort of struck me as I was uh, working as a producer was that uh, for writers, it, it's, or actually, no, let me switch. I, I think the thing that, that, um, I feel like we encounter a lot with um, getting pitched by people as well as by people who want to break in and be writers is that um, to be able to, we, when you're pitching an idea, it's not just what is the idea, it's can you make it happen? And that is partially, do you really have the vision to tell as many stories if you're building a world? You know, does it feel like, ah, that's that might be a short or that might be, um, a one-off special or something. It doesn't feel like a whole world because it really, 8011s is a lot for first season. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's like, 
I, I feel like there's a lot of emphasis on sort of coming up with original IP, but that's just the start. It's really like, how do you make that happen? And do you have an understanding of how to tell stories? So working as a freelance writer, which is a whole nother category of advice, um, can help you really learn how to tell those stories and how to hone your skills in understanding how those stories get made once they once the script is done and once it's passed off into production. Like just really understanding how to, um, and taking every opportunity, like coming to panels like this, so already great job there, um, to pay attention to the craft and to learn about all of that so that it's not just about coming up with like your two page pitch and, you know, and spending honestly a lot of money on character design if you have to pay someone to do that or a lot of development consultants when it's like, you know, I see a lot of people who get some bad advice on that, unfortunately. I think it's like, do your, the work that you do is the work, you know, in learning all of this. So that's kind of a little scattered, but those are some of the things that I, I think about with people who um, want to be breaking into the industry or breaking into a new part of it. That's excellent advice. Um, Jenny asked, do you use focus groups with kids? So do you do focus work? Do you have focus groups, focus testing? So in the beginning, we've done, um, we did a lot of um, testing. We worked with Latoy Adams from uh, Wonder Why Consulting in New York to do storybook testing, uh, not just of the pilot, um, but also um, with some of our episodes, our animated episodes. And, and what she did was um, she worked with her team to create um, these books and images, and they would read the story to kids. And, um, you know, we knew that through PBS's appeals testing that kids like the show, but we were also curious, are kids understanding the curriculum? Are they following Alma's thought process? Are they picking up on, you know, the mental cues of like, you know, oh, this is now when Alma has to stop and think about something and what was her solution and, and how did she think something through? So yeah, we've definitely done focus groups and we wanna do more focus groups um, moving forward. Uh, also, interestingly, we did focus groups with um, children who have cerebral palsy, um, specifically kids who have um, similar uh, diagnoses to Eddie uh, Mambo. Um, we worked with a medical advisor to create that character, and she actually wrote up, an in, um, she and a couple of other doctors wrote up an entire medical history because we wanted to make sure we understood um, what his range of movement was and, and how to best represent him in a way that was authentic and made sense um, for, for, you know, his diagnosis. So we tested that video with kids and showed them the animation and got a lot of really great feedback that we were then able to give to our animation team. And they were able to apply those lessons learned to make sure like, okay, you know, when he's walking down the stairs, he would shift one crutch to the other arm and hold, you know, the stairs with one way, or, you know, he can't carry um, anything over 10 pounds. So if we want him to play the tuba, we got to give him a mini tuba. Um, these are all things like, you know, seemingly small details, but super important to get right. So um, we're looking forward to doing more testing with kids and families, um, you know, moving yeah. forward. That's wonderful. You know, again, there's that, I'm gonna use that word again, authenticity. You, uh, this show, it's just so beautiful. All the work you've done on it and the tremendous attention to detail and the fabulous world you've created for Alma's Way. So, you know, I would like to thank our panelists for being with us tonight giving your time and, and they worked very hard on preparing. We all, we worked on this ahead of time. So this was not just a quick come together. Everyone really wanted to um, share the most, everything they had to share tonight. And thank you so much to everyone who has tuned into the webinar and in the future, those who watch this in the future, we really appreciate it. Um, Ellen, you know, Jorge, Mia, Darren and Dave, thank you. Uh, this was just fantastic. It was a great discussion. And uh, I would like to remind everyone that Alma's Way is streaming free on PBS Kids. If you haven't seen it, please tune in. And there is the link for you to see the Alma's Way episode, Boombox. I probably didn't have the full title there, Ellen. I'm sorry. You could give us the full title. 
Be, oh, beatbox. Beatbox. See, that's Shame okay. Me. And um, Jerry asked in the chat the this video, this recording will be available through the Asifa YouTube. Yes, yes, and Asifa will post it, and um, and the link will be live for quite some time, I believe, for you to watch the episode. And yes, you can also tune into P. Oh, okay, we've got more information on tuning in. So thanks everyone very much. Oh, and um, I guess this is it. So we'll all smile and say thank you. And thank you. have a great time everyone and fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye everybody.